Welcome, everyone. I, uh, my name is Thomas Barcher, and I'll be uh, moderating the panel this afternoon. We are scheduled to go until 6 p.m. I'll make uh, brief introductions of both of our speakers, and then I'll invite you to, uh, to both to speak. Um, we'll start, as it is on the schedule, with Holly and then with James, and then I'll either ask a question or open for questions from the audience. My introductions will be brief, since we don't have um, that much time. I'll say simply that um, Holly Russin Gilman is a fellow at, the, at New America's Political Reform Program, where she leads the Participatory Democracy Project. She's the inaugural fellow at Col Columbia University World Projects. Her research and writing focus on the intersection between civic engagement, digital technology, and governance. She's particularly interested, as are so many people with us today, in revitalizing American democracy for Holly, particularly through local initiatives and digital innovation. A full list of her publications and many awards are on the, the conference website. I'll just note here her most recent book, written with Sabil Rahman, which is of particular interest for the concerns of this conference, titled Civic Power, Rebuilding American Democracy in an Era of Democratic Crisis, published by Cambridge University Press. James Barry, Jr. is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Indiana University Southeast. Dr. Barry has done extensive research on the foundations of scientific thinking in the early modern period, published in his first book, The Measures of Science. His current work, and for a good number of years, has been in and around the thought of Hannah Arendt. He's the editor of Arendt Studies, a journal that will be familiar to many people in the room and online, I'm sure, and he's co-founder of the Hannah Arendt Circle. Dr. Barry is currently working on uh, two projects of particular relevance for our concerns, one on modern poverty and another on the decline of agrarian communities and post-industrial consumerism both with an Arendtian uh, bent, as I understand it. With that, I will welcome Holly, uh, you to begin. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to be here in the interwebs of this esteemed conference and the Arendt Center, which has so many wonderful people advancing these causes. Um, I will try to keep my remarks on the briefer end so that we can open it up for Q&A. So, you know, I was thinking a lot about the sort of origins of my research and how much Arendt had inspired that as an undergrad at the University of Chicago. I was steeped in Hannah Arendt and had the pleasure to take courses from people like Herman Seneca, who actually worked with her. And when I sort of began my research on participatory forms of democracy, a lot of Arendt's thinking around the polis and around sort of humans' unique ability for speech to enable the conditions for freedom played a role of that. And so, you know, I'll just share a few things that many of us know, but I will sort of share them. And then I'm going to outline sort of three opportunities and lessons I see right now in my research for participatory democracy in the United States. So, you know, I was thinking about the quote of Arendt, you know, to be political, to live in a polis meant that everything was decided through words and persuasion and not through force and violence. And, you know, a lot of this for me is about how do we connect people in the local level and sort of reimagining the sort of smaller scale of democracy. For Plato, you know, 5,040 people was the maximum number of people for a unit of government. And the polis with its strengths and weaknesses and, you know, large barriers to entry and, you know, marginalization of many communities was inescapably local. And so when I think about the opportunity right now for developing what I often call, you know, hooks and levers in communities to deepen co-governance models, the local level is such a critical aspect of that. And I think the past year, the demands for racial justice and the COVID crisis have sort of redoubled the impact and the awareness that locality is more central than ever. So I'll sort of talk a little bit about that now. And, you know, when I think of these models of co-governance, I really think about how do we equip 
not just civil society, but everyday people in their communities? And how do we build in those hooks and levers into decision makers so that there is some accountability, there is some pressure, and there are some positive feedback loops between what people are, are demanding and asking for, but also what governance can deliver. So when I think of the example of participatory budgeting, which I'm sure has been, you know, talked about and is very familiar to folks, you know, it stands out to me as an opportunity to really tap into people's hyper local expertise. So, you know, when you look at participatory budgeting in the United States and you see the emphasis on capital allocations, brick and mortar, places where people in their neighborhoods can come out and be seen and heard. And so, you know, the process imported from Brazil after a 20 year military dictatorship in 1989 has sort of been gaining momentum in the United States with one Chicago alderman in 2009, putting a portion of his menu money, discretionary dollars back into the hands of residents. And you've seen momentum when I worked in the White House at the Office of Science Technology Policy, I led our open government and innovation agenda thinking about both how do we as a global partner work to advance open government around the world, but also domestically, how do we really think about what that could look like and are there opportunities with HUD dollars to you know, inject participatory budgeting? That conversation I think is more relevant than ever with the recovery dollars, with the infrastructure spending, and I'll talk a little bit about civic infrastructure in a minute, but thinking about where are those opportunities? You know, New York has been the largest implementation of PB to date. Due to COVID in large part, that process has come to a halt. So I think it'll be really interesting to see if and how that process can gain momentum as an opportunity for people to be experts in their locality and to, to take the size of governance decision making and put it to a place that is manageable and to also ensure that the questions that decision makers are asking of everyday residents are places where they can be experts, parks, rec centers, what transportation do you need in your community? Because I fear too often, you know, we throw out the kind of we're going to engage residents because we're not engaging them in ways that are productive and we're not engaging them in ways that actually tap into their knowledge and in a way that can lead to outcomes. And that requires really resetting expectations and also decision makers being much more transparent and upfront with people in their communities. So my, that brings me to my second lesson, which is sort of the opportunity to think about bureaucratizing participation within these government decision bodies. And you know, you're seeing a push for this on the federal level, the Biden-Harris administration on you know, the first few days in office released an equity EO, really focused on reimagining you know, how we would do policy and how we would look at things like cost benefit analysis. There's a second EO that looks at modernizing the rule and regulatory process to try to think beyond things like cost benefit analysis. And there is actually a provision to think more deeply about what civic engagement in particular for traditionally marginalized communities could look like. And so that's an opportunity that is happening across the federal government in cities and localities. You're seeing sort of innovation offices being embedded and launched. And I think there are questions about if and how these offices can create sort of bureaucratized opportunities for residents to engage in the decision-making process. Some have more opportunities for engagement than others. You know, moving beyond lip service or PR campaigns, thinking about ways where there's actually skin in the game in terms of what these decisions look like. You know, there's a few offices that come to mind when I think about this. Um, Boston's Office of New Urban Mechanics has been a real innovator in terms of going out to the community. For example, you know, when they've had things around middle-income housing, they've actually built little housing units and driven them out to the community to have people walk through them and share their input and expertise. In New York, through a ballot initiative, they launched the first Civic Engagement Commission to sort of institutionalize the kind of engagement. The remit is both community board engagement, but also participatory budgeting. And this is not just happening, you know, in the East Coast, you're seeing this all across the country. Places are trying to embed these offices, you know, Detroit has their first chief storyteller position. There are different, you know, offices that are happening in the municipal governments where there is sort of an opportunity, I think, to widen the aperture of what traditional local government looks like and how it can create that space for hooks and levers to equip residents and in particular traditionally marginalized voices 
especially black and brown communities in the decision making process. And then my final point is about the sort of practice of democracy, the people and places where there are the opportunity for people to come together and to strengthen our civic muscles. As part of this work, I'm leading the working group for the American Academy of Arts and Sciences um, our common purpose report, there was one recommendation focused on civic infrastructure to think about what it would look like to launch a national trust for civic infrastructure that could really fund these people and these places and practices of democracy. And for me, the last year has really underscored the power of public spaces in how people engage and understand their democratic life. So everything from the Reimagine the Civic Commons Initiative, which is a donor collaborative of key sites in Akron, Chicago, Detroit, Memphis, and Philadelphia, which has brought together national funders and local partners to reimagine spaces to an initiative that I'm obsessed with um, called ROCKS, which is in Kentucky, and it stands for the Rural Urban Exchange. And this is a creative leadership program to build confidence, social capital, bridge divides, unite Kentuckians, and people come together, you know, for about 75 hours of programming over the year. And it's really focused on people, place, and partnership. And I'm going to sort of uh, wrap up with a quote that I love from a, a Rux participant. You know, I love the intention of Rux going into different communities and seeking out the hidden figures who are really making that community, city, or town thrive. And as always, it's the folks really at the margins operating in less than what they actually need and doing incredible things with that. And so for me, there is obviously no one panacea to strengthen our civic muscles and to build more opportunities, mechanisms for collaborative participatory democracy. But I have been inspired that I'm seeing more demand signals um, on behalf of the decision makers who are in many of these you know, seats of power. And I think there is a clear demand signal from people that they want to be more fully engaged in these processes. So I look forward to hearing from Dr. Barry and I really welcome any questions on these topics. Thank you for having me. Uh, James, you're welcome to begin. So I'm, uh, I'm going to use um, PowerPoint presentation only because I've got way too much uh, to say and I tried to whittle it down as best I could. Uh, so uh, the title that I, that I gave uh, Roger was not quite this title. Um, but my, my interest here is to bring Hunter Rent and Wendell Berry together. Uh, and it was really sort of this cross reading of the two of them that led me to think about the importance of resisting the long history of the loss of land-based community. So um, I have an opening quote, and this is really where I began to think about these issues was in reading Arendt's On Revolution. Um, so let me talk about that, and I'll try to keep it to about 10 minutes. Um, so th this is the quote that got me to thinking about what I see as the losses and gains of living in a society defined by placelessness. Uh, and so I'll just read this very quickly. We have difficulties today in perceiving the great potency of this principle because the intimate connection between property and freedom is for us no longer a matter of course. Not before the 20th century were people exposed directly and without any personal protection to the pressures of either state or society. And when people emerged who were free without owning property to protect their liberties were, were laws necessary to protect persons and personal freedom directly instead of merely protecting their properties. So this presentation is really not about sortition. Um, but it is about broad-based public life, both as it was and as it can be. In fact, I argue that the question of how to face the long history of the loss of land-based community bears crucially on the possibility of any lasting civic innovation. I ask you to consider the following proposition. Can we have an effective and lasting shared public life if we do not recognize the ways in which such a life is fundamentally dependent on a shared concrete place? 
Such places have always been grounded in a sense of belonging to a given locality of land. It may be that until we engage in a shared reflection on the loss of this prerequisite of being secured in a local land-based community, that we will continue to suffer all the risks and rewards that come with placelessness, that is, the long-term rise of the modern alienation from place and from one another that now defines our world. And again, that last uh, line is really uh, an example of the intersection between Wendell Berry and Hannah Arendt as I, as I read them. And then two quotes, the first from Wendell Berry and the second from uh, Arendt. For humans to have a responsible relationship to the world, they must imagine their places in it. To have a place, to live and belong in a place, to live from a place without destroying it, we must imagine it. By imagination, we see it illuminated by its own unique character and by our love for it. And then I put that up against another quote from Arendt's On Revolution, this one perhaps the most important in terms of this, this project. Uh, this is from the, the, the second to last chapter. If the ultimate end of revolution was freedom in the constitution of a public space where freedom could appear, then the elementary republics of the wards, right, these smallest local uh, communities that uh, Jefferson could imagine of 100 or 300 citizens, but the elementary republics of the wards uh, were the only tangible place where everyone could be free. They actually were the end of the great republic, whose chief purpose in domestic affairs should have been to provide the people with such places of freedom and to protect them. Well, the first quote that I gave you from the same text of Arendt's, right, suggests that this is precisely what's sacrificed. This is what goes away. So lately, I've come to think about Arendt's on revolution as a prolonged exhortation one which should remind us that the ruined world in which we live is our shared legacy and our joint responsibility. This ruined world which we have all inherited embodies reminders of the treasures we have lost. These treasures may not be recoverable, but together we can discover the far-reaching consequences of what we have lost. That is, if we are willing to engage in such shared reflections on what we have been given. My claim is that, for both Arendt and Barry, the long history of the loss of land-based community is a common legacy that we must remember and understand in order to resist the reality of displacement, displacement, that is, if we are to establish effective and lasting shared places in the world where we can act and think together. One of the clearest connections between Arendt and Barry is found in their shared appeal to Jefferson's concept of the Ward Republic. Both recognize Jefferson's late in life call for a vital, dynamic public life at the most local level as a key concern, one that can shed a great deal of light on our own contemporary crisis in public life. As a writ reads it, Jefferson's appeal to wards is not so much a theoretical endeavor as a recollection of the local landed communities that served as the inspiration, the starting point for the constitutional project and the focus on smaller or limited government. However, the fact that states and even counties come to be the definition of smaller and more self-determining rule by the people shows the loss of the truly local form of public life. Barry and Arendt's respective ex explorations of the complex connections at play in Jefferson's notion of the war republics serve to help us to remember that effective local public life needs to be grounded in a land-based community where most, if not all, the ward participants are small landowners or belong to the land in some way. Barry's emphasis on possessing and being possessed by the land is not an overt theme in Arendt's work, but she does echo the Jeffersonian call for broad-based dispersion of land quite forcefully in her recommendation for how best to resist the forces of expropriation that define the modern world we have been given and to this point have accepted. And this is from the Toronto conference that she attended in 1972. These processes of expropriation you have everywhere to make, excuse me, to make a decent amount of property available to every human being not expropriate, but to spread property, then you will have some possibilities for freedom, even under the rather inhuman, inhuman conditions of modern production. Read together, Barry and Arendt offer us a different way of understanding how we've come to live in a world whose chief virtues are expropriation and consumption and waste. Virtues that have been willingly embraced despite their costs to both the people and the land on which they once dwelled. This way of understanding the cost of the long history of the loss of land-based community depends on our ability to imagine another version of the world 
one in which the losses as well as the gains are comprehended. Only then can we hope to imagine the world filled, as Barry puts it, not with the junk of fantasy and unconsciousness, for that is no more than the industrial economy would do, but to see them first clearly with the eyes and then to see them with the imagination and their sanctity as belonging to the creation. In other words, for Barry and Arendt, what defines our current predicament are the losses of a concrete common world whose viability depends on belonging to the land as more than an abstract site for occupation. Finally, in Arendt's account of Jefferson's worries about the spread of private corruption or corruption from below, one finds perhaps the most important connection between Arendt and Barry, namely an effort on both their parts to trace elements of the long history by which certain ever-growing and dominant economic commitments come to all but bury the possibility of a broad-based and locally centered public life. In other, words, in other words, a world in which expropriation becomes a psychological and political gain and placelessness a social virtue above all others. Uh, and then by way of conclusion, before I introduce three questions uh, that I've been thinking about uh, as I've worked on this project, between Barry and Arendt, we can trace the texture of our long-term joint participation in the loss of place, private and public, in terms of the gains and losses inherent in what Barry refers to as the total economy, where, quote, stable and preserving relationships among people, places, and things do not matter and are of no worth. Here, Barry and Arendt's concerns would seem to converge. The rise of the new norm of placelessness, of expropriation as a political virtue, has been fueled by the ongoing mass acceptance of abstract individual rights and benefits as a surrogate for power. But power for Arendt and Barry is local and place power, coming, quote, into being where people get together and bind themselves through promises, covenants, and mutual pledges. That's also from the uh, second to last chapter of On Revolution. For both of them, this coming together depends on a shared place where this uh, sharing is not meant in some abstract or distant way. Facing the long history of the loss of land-based community together would then be a necessary but undoubtedly protracted first step towards the possibility of establishing the many local land-based communities, which as Arendt warns us are, quote, the only tangible place where everyone could be free. And then by way of closing, I wanted to sort of share the three questions that I've been thinking about uh, for the last couple of years. The first one, are we prepared to face this long history of the loss of land-based community directly and to understand that facing it may be essential to creating and sustaining an, an effective public life? Second, do we understand the scope of the losses and gains that we have accepted as part of living detached from the land and from the neighborly life that belong to the land can engender? And third, what would be required if we were to face these losses and gains more directly and honestly? What sorts of changes in how we live together in the world would occur as part of an effective and meaningful response to these losses and gains? Thank you, I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's one of the um, marvels and glories of the Arendt Center and of Roger's work generally that it has such a big tent and uh, there are uh, so many things brought together. In this conference, I'm uh, aware of the um, emphasis on um, very uh, abstract theoretical concerns and also very um, particular practical concerns. Uh, and also, as Roger said at the beginning of the conference, the focus on um, a burgeoning discourse around deliberative democracy linked to a tradition of um, civic republicanism in an Arendtian spirit. And it's uh, one of, it, I think one of the things we see in this panel is two very different talks that um, can be intersected and brought into relation with one another in um, ways that I won't be able to do, but hopefully you will. Uh, I do have a couple of questions that I'll ask, but I feel like the, um, certainly one point of intersection between these two talks is the significance of the local that was, uh, Holly, the beginning of your um, remarks. Uh, the fir your first point was on the, uh, the importance of the local um, for these initiatives, and obviously that's uh, central uh, to James' your remarks as well. And I think there's also um, 
uh, Holly, you mentioned the role of the, sto the uh, chief storyteller. I forget I don't know if it was in Chicago or someplace else. And I think something about storytelling uh, links these two as well. But uh, the, the good, I don't have the good question, uh, so I'll just ask uh, the poor ones that I have of each of you. And Holly, my question for you is, um, it, and this, this comes in part from the reading, um, what you had given us to read in the, um, uh, the reader for the conference. You mentioned at one point, see if I can find the quote. This was about um, participatory budgeting and how that would work. You talked about the advantages that it uh, brings and you um, raised the point that it requires dis decision makers to be willing to give up some of their power. And my question is, what is the incentive as you understand it? for decision makers to give up. The carrot, stick, is it the threat of um, not being elected? How, how is that achieved? What's the, um, what's the incentive for them they, or the fear that they're responding to? And uh, my question for James, and then maybe you can both answer and then I'll open for uh, the audience. And also, I welcome you to address one another uh, as you wish. Um, my question for James, uh, you brought something to the conference that I haven't um, heard much talk of yet, which is uh, about the past. This conference is very much about the future and about possibility, and uh, your focus is on something that is uh, past and that is lost, particularly, and the, your emphasis on the need to recognize and face uh, the loss. And what I'm wondering is if you can say more uh, about why, why that needs to be done. Why not simply look forward. We have these problems and we're looking for solutions. It seems like uh, you, you have an intuition about there being uh, some profound fault in the way we would proceed if we don't begin with a recognition of the loss. And I'm not sure I understand at least uh, why that's necessary, why we can't just move forward from where we are. So those are my two questions. Holly, uh, I invite you first to respond. These are great questions, and James, I really also appreciate it, and I learned a lot from your presentation. I mean, I think that connection, sort of Arendt and Wendell and then to Jefferson, I thought was really interesting, and, and I appreciate the sort of thing we were saying about the, the Rogers point around the deliberative discourse connected to the world of practice. I mean, I think a few quick thoughts on this, and it will tie back to your, your question, which I think is an excellent question for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and I think also, um, you know, James, listening to your talk, you know, when I think of the the sort of also what was lost in the past year and a half and sort of people feeling like they weren't able to escape necessarily those confined roles to be in the polis and thinking of sort of Unger's interpretation of a rent here that the confined, uh, the escape from our confined roles is an expression of freedom. And so, you know, is there an opportunity to look for more expressions of freedom. And so to your question, what are the incentives for elected officials? I think there's there's many, and I think the last year and a half have, have shifted them as well. So, you know, when I was working on a lot of this stuff and I've been working with many local leaders, I think too often there is a perception that leaders are, you know, they're gonna open up Pandora's box and there's gonna be a fear of engaging the public without really translating that engagement into action. And so I think part of what that requires for a mitigation strategy is having, you know, more transparency mechanisms so that people can be upfront about what's on the table and what's not, sort of seeing the proverbial sausage being made. When you look at something like participatory budgeting, it's sort of a hands-on civics education. And it's, you know, it's reduced the barriers of who can vote in the US. And so you're seeing the process open to people so often as young as 12 years old. And I've seen sort of people volunteering their time after hours to explain to young people, you know, how the Department of Transportation in a given city does their policy making. And so all this is to say, I think given the crisis of our democracy and the clear lack of trust and legitimacy facing so many government decision-making bodies, to me, that is part of the incentive. It's about people in decision-making power wanting to widen the aperture and open it up towards more, you know, transparent and legitimating forms of governance. I also think there is an argument to be made that there is an effectiveness argument. 
that people in their local communities, you know, tapping into this theme that I think you've rightly hit on about place and locality and, and knowledge and storytelling are the ones who can sort of, can, you know, convey that information in a way that is free from special interests and traditional entrenched power. So I see, I see both sides of that equation and effectiveness, tapping into knowledge and expertise towards better outcomes. But then I also see the incentive for people to want to, you know, create more forms of deliberative participatory democracy to address this sort of real crisis of trust and lack of legitimacy in governance. I'll turn it over to you, James. I wanted to say that Holly and I had a chance to talk uh, last week. I think it was last week. Uh, and uh, um, I, I agree with your comments, Thomas, that there, there is this important uh, overlap in what we're doing, and it does bear on the local. Um, I think for, for me, uh, I, I think uh, I'm happy that Holly and people uh, working in the areas that she's working with are optimistic, and I will admit that I'm probably not optimistic. Uh, when it comes to the local and that I would probably be tempted to say that um, as I guess I was hinting in my comments earlier that the local has been impoverished in important ways, uh, has lost its, its power in important ways. These are the things, of course, that Jefferson was worried about and this is why he thought small government was important and that's why he thought the ward republics were the heart, the, the living heart uh, of representative democracy. Um, so anyway, I think there, we have to work on all fronts on this. Um, to, to your question, Thomas, and, and, and like Holly, I think it's an important question. As a matter of fact, it's the question when I first, uh, when I gave the first version of this paper uh, at the Arendt Circle two years ago in Edmonton, I was labeled, uh, and I, I, I'm sure it was meant in the best possible way, as a kind of defunct nostalgiac, right? I, I want to get t-shirts paid. But, Defunct nostalgia, nice bright purple. Uh, anyway, uh, so th this is this is a problem. When we look to uh, the past, uh, I think there's a tendency to think of it as nostalgia. My my argument is not an original one. It's borrowed from a rent, uh, and I think we all know it well from On Revolution, where she talks about the lost treasure. And this lost treasure is not something that I think she thinks we should say. You know. We should, we should have a funeral for and be done. I think we're, we're obliged, this is the exhortation as I read it, that we're obliged to look at it. We need to understand what happened in terms of US agricultural policy in 1952. We need to understand the strange ambivalent nature of, uh, of the, the Land Act of 1862. We need to understand the way in which the question of land is uh, at, at the heart of the Civil War. We need to understand all of those things and, and if we're not engaging in that conversation, then I don't think there's very much we can do to move forward that's not going to backfire on us. So that's the, that's the short version. I'm tempted to ask uh, Holly for you to respond, but I think I ought to open to the audience. Uh, well, I'll begin in the room, and does someone have a microphone that can be brought around? Uh, there's uh, two, I see two people right in the center of the room here, Roger. Thank you. Yeah, hi, thanks very much um, to all three. Uh, I have a, maybe a, a slightly red herring of a question, um, which is really about the status of the urban in uh, your thinking. Um, and particularly, Dr. Berry, I kept thinking that the, that the nostalgia for a kind of agrarian land possession, uh, I use that word nostalgia, um, with quotes around it, um, uh, worried me because, for one thing, it seemed to point to me to a certain kind of privilege. Those people who get to own land are totally privileged. But on the other side of it is what what happens in your in your thinking uh, to the urban, to the whole idea of a kind of um, uh, that comes. I guess was was most powerful in the 20th century and now in the 21st century, I think it is a real active question. So I address that question to both of you. James, maybe you can begin. Right, so this, this is, I think, a, a question that's gonna require uh, a lot of talk. Um, 
I think especially in the last uh, few years, uh, we've seen uh, this kind of polarization, political polarization between the urban and the rural, uh, which I think is based upon stereotypes of a certain sort. But, the, but there's no denying that the fact is, if you look at just something as crude as census data from 1800 to uh, 2000, right, uh, you see the shift, right? In Jefferson's time, less than 10% of the people lived in an urban setting. Uh, in our time, it's about a 80, 78%, something like that. Uh, and many of the people who live in under the census t uh, label of rural are not actually rural. They live, just live in smaller sort of uh, suburban or exurban tracts. So we, we've had this dramatic shift in, uh, uh, in going from the, the rural to the urban as a sort of general orientation. But I think um, the question still stands uh, in terms of urban life, because I think it's, it, it's still this notion of place. Uh, this is why you have, for example, urban gardens, you have, uh, uh, you have people who recognize the importance of land, uh, parks, so forth and so on, uh, in ways that's, that's really important. So uh, that is in no way to deny the importance of this question. It, 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 needs, to be, it needs to be talked about uh, in a broad-based way. Holly? I mean, I think it's a really, it's a great question. Uh, you know, I was thinking about some of the work I'm doing on trying to build a national trust for civic infrastructure and, you know, working with communities, rural communities, urban communities, and thinking about what, what can unite us? Like, what are the places where there are more commonalities and especially where have we learned lessons from the pandemic? I'm thinking of sort of some of these critical functions that are required as the undergirding of democracy, whether it's broadband access or, you know, paid family leave. Like, are there places where there's almost too much emphasis put on the urban rural dichotomy? Granted, there are real questions of equity and of historic racism that need to be addressed, but are there also opportunities for recognizing that there are some commonalities in what is required, I think, for revitalizing democracy in, in both of these places? Thank you. Uh, and I'm reminded that uh, Roger had asked uh, um, speakers to introduce themselves. So the previous question was from Anne Lauterbach, and the next is from Thomas Wild. Uh, thank you. Hi. Um, my question follows up on this uh, previous discussion about the status or the way you understand uh, the local. I would like to hear more about that, possibly in the following way. Uh, since, uh, James, this is mostly a question for you, um, um, but essentially for both of you. Since you base your uh, reading or suggestions also on a, on a reading of Arendt, and there's an interesting uh, tie back to, a pr to the previous panel, and I think a tension where uh, Schmuel reminded us that uh, for Arendt, like the polis, or here, uh, of course, the wards, are an example of an experience of political action. Not necessarily a model, but an example from which experience can be um, drawn, so to speak. And that one of the characteristics is that the polis is everywhere, so to speak, where people come together and act not necessarily where they are rooted. So my question is very much about your understanding of a rootedness or a possibility of a nomadic, uh, let's say, shape of this, um, uh, of, of this um, community that, um, uh, that acts together. And the connected question to that is maybe too obvious and you might ignore it if it's too obvious. Uh, I was wondering, uh, James, if for you, the, the assemblies would be a way uh, that have been discussed uh, here all day of, um, of, an, of a uh, re revitalized or an, a, a political action that you could see within your framework or you see that rather in attention to that if we think of the discussion earlier that uh, citizens could also be understood as people who are not actually citizens, live there, are rooted, but come through and still participate. Thank you. Uh, since this was directed primarily at James, I'll invite you, James, to respond first, but then Holly, uh, you as well. Yeah, so this, um, this is another uh, question that, that deserves uh, a very, very, very long discussion over and over again by many people. 
Um, the, the, the question, as I've been thinking about it, and as I've been discussing it with people, um, has to do with the status of different, pe of different groups of people in this country, um, uh, whether they be uh, a Native American or whether they be African American uh, or, or whatever. And what's interesting is that there's this shared view, at least on the part of significant numbers. I'm thinking of the land back movement, for example, uh, among certain tribes. Uh, is, is that there's this importance of the land as a grounding principle. That doesn't mean that we're trapped uh, on a specific locale, but it's the place from which we begin. And it's the place as uh, before we're adults that I think we, 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 get, our, we get our bearings. Uh, so the question of education comes into, into this as well. So um, uh, I, I think that the question of rootedness, uh, as Thomas, as Thomas mentioned, it is is very important here. And, and as we all know, for a rent from from the beginning uh, of her work, at least with the original preface to the totalitarianism book, she's concerned about Bodenlosigkeit. She's concerned about these problems of rootlessness uh, and powerlessness, and she links them all together. Uh, and then the status of refugees, I think, can also be brought into this, the, the, the need for a grounding in land. So I think uh, uh, this is a question that, that can't be answered by any one person. And my, my, uh, my effort is only to remind us that it, at least to this point in history, the way in which uh, communities seem to be defined uh, has uh, this legacy in number one, land-based community, but number two, the loss of land-based community. So it's this ambivalent, uh, ambivalent legacy that we've been given. I'll leave it at that. And uh, Holly, I, I see the looming timekeeper, so I think you're going to have the last word here. Uh, you're welcome to respond to the question. Also, anything else you might want to say? Uh-oh. Well, these are, these are such rich questions. And I mean, I think it's really interesting, this idea of the definition to land and then that's sort of in opposition to it. Uh, I think the only thing that I was thinking of that question is just, and we obviously, I don't want to just put this, I'm going to put it out there. We won't have time to discuss it. Just, I'm thinking of large scale online deliberative democracy forums that I've been a part of and done a lot of research on and thinking about, you know, how that plays a role, looking at, you know, the Decidum platform, which you're seeing governments using for more participatory democracy. And I'm just trying to, you know, think in my own head, where is that an opportunity for more transnational identities while also recognizing the locality of place and the primacy of that and, and, and how to hold that tension, but then also understand that opportunity as part of this broader, you know, movement and moment to tie around in with this deliberative democracy discourse. I think the role of sort of digital public spaces and addressing those also inequities within them is going to be, I think, one of the big tensions to address. So thank you so much. This has been a very rich conversation. I've learned a lot. I'd like to thank the citizens of the world for their attention, the citizens of this hall for your attention, and I'd like to ask you all to join us in thanking James and Holly. <laughs>